think that, that there will be different transitions in different parts of the world, right? And uh, Latin America is starting from a very good point. Uh, the region as, uh, as a whole is uh, between 60-70% renewable already. Uh, it's, it's, as you probably know, uh, there are pledges uh, done by all the countries in the region in order to go to net zero by 2050. But uh, there will be, you know, fast countries and laggards, uh, as uh, it always happens, because it's, it's a reality of uh, what we are living through. Each country is different. Each country is in a different situation. There are countries that are uh, high and middle class. They don't have many people in the poverty line and they're importers of energy. It's better for them to move faster and to have renewable energy and uh, uh, wean themselves away from the volatility of the, of, of the importing hydrocarbons and importing fuels. So that's gonna happen rapidly. Other countries that have big resources that they want to monetize or big uh, swatches of people under the poverty line are going to take longer to, to, to get there. So each country is going to find its own path in the region and at its own pace. I think that uh, sharing experiences and good practices and the, the way of doing different things and you know how to apply, regionally apply solutions that are working in Europe or North America but has to be adapted to the, uh, to the reality of the regions is critical. So um, forums like these are, are very, very important for the decarbonization and the energy transition in the region. But during the pandemic, a lot of people stepped back and said, well, how, how are we living? What are we using for our resources? So that highlighted, we've seen carbon credits as an example of a market that exploded over the last two years, really coming out of the pandemic. So there's a dialogue at a, what we would say, a, a much larger level of societies. It's kind of top, bottom, middle, everywhere people are talking about that. And ultimately, we believe that that will be a, a good thing. So the awareness is much higher. I think one of the benefits of carbon credits is that they serve as a financing mechanism, both for clean energy as well as protection of our forests. So we do have right now is actually timely because we have COP15 in Montreal right now, which is over biodiversity. So we have not only climate change as a theme, but we have biodiversity loss as a, as a theme. So using financing mechanisms that support transition to clean energy, help protect our forests and our marine ecosystems, is something that's just positive for humanity across the board. You have the SEC, for example, is now asking public companies in the United States, they're going to have to disclose their carbon footprint. You're seeing ESG as an investment style, which has been around for a long time, you're seeing that grow with tremendous interest from pension funds and institutional investors. This puts a lot of pressure to find new ways, new asset classes and new mechanisms that are net zero in this case or planet positive, depending on how you want to describe it. And so the, the interest has risen tremendously to, to support these types of markets. Well, you know, uh, where uh, the oil industry is decarbonizing its production. So it's decarbonizing its operations. That's a low hanging fruit. Uh, by energy efficiency, by uh, digital trans transformation, um, avoiding venting, avoiding uh, 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 losses, you know, we got gas losses into the atmosphere, etc. So we're, we're doing our part. And we're also, uh, we're also venturing into renewable technologies. Some can be extrapolated from our competencies, like geothermal and uh, offshore wind and CCUS. They're just part of what we know what to do. But our member companies, member companies of Arpel, are stepping further away and going into solar, going into uh, wind, going into green hydrogen, uh, mining for lithium, uh, and planting forests. So we to think we're doing our part. We need all the technologies at the same time. There's no holy grail. There, there's nothing there that, that can solve the problem finally or can replace oil and gas. So I light a candle for fusion, but it may happen one day. I don't think in my lifetime, but, but, it, but, it, but, it, but it may happen. Latin America is uh, able to uh, produce more gas, is able to contribute to the carbonization of uh, other areas in the world. We must consider that really if we want to decarbonize the world, this is an issue that, that happens in Asia, there are big economies in Asia need to change from the coal to gas. Um, the development of the resources that Latin America has is a real opportunity for them. Uh, we should consider that there is a region with 
the lowest GDP per capita just after Africa. And this can help them to have more positive cash flows. And with these positive cash flows, they can contribute to decarbonize other sectors that are maybe more difficult to decarbonize, like the transport, really related to the, this GDP per capita. Okay, When we talk about the electrification of the cars, we, we should consider if these uh, people can afford even changing their car. No? So it's a good way to improve their economies, Okay, as well as decarbonizing other, other parts of the world. We are discussing many times about what's happening in 2050, 2060, and 2070. But if we follow what the scientific community is telling us, uh, and we have consumed the equivalent of this 1.1 degrees, and with a likelihood of more than 85%, we can have a breach uh, of this 1.5 degrees, and we should take measures in this, uh, in this decade. No? So it, this dialogue help us in an openly uh, discussion okay, to uh, achieve more pragmatic solutions. Okay? Mm -hmm.